day when heaven was filled with his praises one day when sin was as black as could be jesus came forth to be born of a virgin dwelt among men my example is he the word became precious the light shined among us his glory we be living he loved dying he said buried he carried my sins far away rising he does freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day one day they first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. 
While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Happy Resurrection Day. Diane and I, as the pastoral couple at New Life Community Church in Hobart, want to extend a warm Easter greeting to you from our household to yours. And for those of you that are our guests, we, we want to say a hearty welcome to you as well, from our church family to your family. Uh, we're going to engage in the traditional Easter greeting. It goes like this. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now you join us. Let's do this together. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope that filled the room that you're watching in with a celebratory shout of joy. It's something you could practice with one another as family throughout the day. We're delighted that you're joining us today for this Easter Sunday service. And we'd invite you to check in as you watch on Facebook. You can uh, make comments. Let us know that you're present in the chat area. Uh, if you're watching on our Facebook or on our website, you can click the welcome button, fill out that welcome, uh, that virtual connection card. Let us know if there's ways that we can be of service to you. This is our heart's desire, that God would give to you a wonderful, wonderful Easter day. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin For your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Oh, ash was redeemed, only beauty remained and my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over. I'm a prisoner no more Shame was a rest Be faithfully more He canceled my death And he called me his friend Yeah. 
Savior displayed on a criminal's cross And darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost to you. Uh, my name is Jason. I have the privilege of being the youth pastor here at New Life Community Church Holbert. And I uh, just want to extend a hearty happy Easter to you and to your family. I want to read some scripture to us this morning. This is coming from Luke chapter 24 verses 35 through 48. And after I read this, I'm going to lead us through a time of some guided prayer in which I will be providing some directives for you to join me in a time of very specific, very intentional, very uh, God-focused prayer. So let's jump in, Luke chapter 24, uh, verses 35 through 48. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road, and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were t telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they had just seen a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. Still, they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations. Beginning, beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of these things. So if you would, in the next few moments, I want to lead us through a time of prayer. And we're going to be using the ACTS form of prayer. This is simply A-C-T-S, four segments of our prayer time this morning, in which we're gonna be taking time to focus on four different um, aspects of prayer. The first letter is the letter A, 
which stands for adoration. This is where we tell God how great he is and express, um, you know, to God how magnificent his name is. Then we move on to the letter C, which is confession. This is where we, where we come before the Lord in, in our humble state and, and acknowledge his holiness. And, and as a result of that uh, scenario, confess our sins before him. Then we move on to the letter T, which is thanksgiving. We thank God for all that we have. We thank God for shelter, for the, the things that we have in this life. We thank Him for our families. We thank Him for our church. We thank Him for, hopefully, as we reflect on the meaning of today, salvation. And then we move on to the letter S, the last segment of our prayer time, which is simply supplication. This is where we ask God for the things that we need. Where we come to Him in humility and say, God, I need your help with this. So would you join me in a time of prayer as we walk through this Acts form of prayer, A-C-T-S. And uh, I just want to encourage you to just pour your heart out to the Lord for these next few moments. So I'm going to start, and then at various times I will go silent and just allow you to, uh, to share with the Lord what is on your heart in regard to those various segments. So let's pray. Father God, we want to come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, that you are great and you are awesome. Father, we acknowledge that, that this is a magnificent day. The tomb is empty, Father. We thank you for that. And Father, in these next few moments, we want to spend some time adoring your name. We want to spend some time confessing to you our sins. We want to spend some time thanking you for the great God that you are and the things that you have provided for us. But then also, Lord, we want to spend some time in supplication where we bring our requests before you. So as we move on to this first segment, we want to tell God how awesome he is, how magnificent he is. So Father, we want to say that you are magnificent. We want to say that you are awesome. We want to say that, that you are glorious. That you are incomprehensible. You are indescribable. You are holy. I want to encourage you if you're watching us this morning to just spend some time in your own, home, your own heart. Just telling God how great and how awesome he is to you. Next, we move on to confession. This is where we tell God, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for misrepresenting you. I'm sorry for missing the mark. I'm sorry for sinning against you. So Father, we come before you once again this morning and we just want to say we're sorry, Lord. We're sorry for the ways in which we rub your name in the mud, in which we don't give you the proper position in our lives that you deserve, that you are worth. We confess the ways in which we have not loved our neighbor this week. We confess the ways in which we have not loved you this week. We confess the ways in which we've thought evil about those around us, where we've just done things, Lord, that is not in line with your word. We confess those before you this, this morning, Lord. So if you're watching this morning, I just want to encourage you to just spend some time examining your heart this morning and just think through some ways in which in the past week um, you have sinned against God and bring that before Him. He is a loving Father. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So spend the next few moments confessing to God the ways in which you have fallen short. And I will do the same. Next, we move on to letter T, which is Thanksgiving. 
This is where we tell God how grateful we are for what he's done for us. We, we express gratitude. We express thanksgiving for the ways in which he's blessed us. So let's go before the Lord for these next few moments and just thank him for what he's done in our lives. Father, as always, we want to thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ that we celebrate this morning. We want to thank you for salvation. We want to thank you, God, that you give us hope unlike any other. That you have made a way, that you have, you have made the way for salvation. You have made it possible for us to be reconciled to you because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But not only that, God, we thank you for salvation, but we also want to thank you for the many things that you have blessed us with in this life. We thank you for shelter. We thank you for um, the food and the water that you have provided for us. We thank you, Lord, for, uh, for um, the ways in which you, provide, you have provided for us financially. We want to thank you for, for relatively good health. But also, Lord, we want to thank you this morning that you are sovereign. God, that no matter what is going on around us, God, it is not, a, it is not caught you by surprise. We thank you for that, Lord. So these next few moments, I just want you to go before the Lord this morning and thank him for the things that he has done in your life. Take a while and examine the past month or weeks or years. And just thank God for the ways in which you have seen him act in your life. And I will do the same. And then we'll come back and we'll wrap this time of prayer up with some supplication. Now we want to spend some time asking God for what we need. This is the letter S, supplication. We're just simply just bringing our requests before the Lord. So I'm going to lead us in a time, as I've, always, as I've been doing so far, but we're just going to bring some requests before the Lord, some, some general requests, and then I'm going to turn it over to you for a little bit to just give you the opportunity to present the Lord with your needs this morning. So Father, we come before you this morning and we just want to pray, Lord, that your spirits would move in our midst. I pray specifically for those who are watching at home right now. God, that you would fill them with a sense of your spirit, God, that ultimately overflows in, in rivers of, of living water, Father and peace and, and, and comfort and whatever it is that we find ourselves needing this morning. I pray, Lord, that there will be people in our midst that come to know you, that come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. And Father, I pray that you would enable your body, your church, to be bold for the sake of the gospel. God, you have given us reason to celebrate this morning, God, because the tomb is empty. But God, you've also sent us out on mission. And Father, we need help with that mission. So God, we simply ask this morning that you would help us in that regard, that you would help us to reach our friends, coworkers, neighbors, other people we come into contact with, with the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And God, that through that testimony, you would produce amazing fruit, that you would bring a harvest, God, that is incomprehensible, just like you are. So I want to give you a few moments this morning just to present some requests to the Lord. Maybe you've got uh, some, some needs in your family right now, maybe uh, some health concerns, or, or maybe you've got some people in your family that... Um, need to know the goodness of Jesus Christ and maybe you just want to lift their name up before the Lord and say God would you draw them to you would you reach them Father? so take the next few moments and present the Lord with your needs 
And then I will come back and we'll close our time of prayer this morning and uh, we'll go on. thank you for this time of prayer we want to thank you once again that we can come before you we can come boldly into your presence father because of what jesus christ did father i pray that this is not the only time that we pray but father that our prayer becomes a, a, a part of who we are that we are a people of prayer that we are a people that come boldly into your presence regularly regularly and Father, that the words of the Apostle Paul would be true of us, that, that we would pray without ceasing, that we would live a lifestyle of prayer. And God, that through it, you would be glorified in all things. We thank you, Lord, so much. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, enjoy the rest of the service this morning. Once again, just want to extend a hearty happy Easter to you and to your family. God bless you. Resurrection Day is the most significant day uh, of our faith life, both individually and for us as a community of, of believers. And as we consider what took place on that Sunday morning following that Passover weekend 2,000 years ago, it really is a make or break moment with regard to the way that we live as Christians. Many antagonists have recognized that what we believe about Christianity hinges on the reality, the verifiability of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And so they have set out to discredit Christianity by disproving the historicity of the resurrection. And not a few in the process of attempting to do so have come to recognize that what Jesus claimed uh, is really the case, that he did rise from the dead that he is who he claimed to be. In our small groups over the past number of weeks, we've been studying a booklet by one such individual. Lee Strobel was an investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And when his wife became a Christ follower, he set out to prove that uh, what she believed was simply a myth. What she believed maybe was even worse than that. Maybe it was actually a deceptive lie. And so over the course of his extensive and expert investigation, his research, he came to the undeniable conclusion that Jesus really did rise from the dead and that Jesus was who he claimed to be. That little booklet is simply called A Case for Easter. And, and if you'd like a copy, we'd be happy to send one to you free. Um, you read the book, you look at the evidence that Lee Strobel put together, and then you decide for yourself. I'll tell you at the end of our message how, how you can get a copy if you would like one. Well, today on Resurrection Day, we wrap up our current series that we've simply called Verified. It's a look at the various identities of the Lord Jesus Christ as portrayed in the Gospel of Luke. We have seen that he is God, fully God. We have seen that he is man, fully human. Uh, we have seen him as the healer and as the storm quieter, really the, the God of creation. We've seen him as the servant and as the forgiver. Last week on Palm Sunday, we saw him once again as the king, not just the king of the Jews, but the king of our lives as well. And today, Resurrection Day, we look at him as the risen one. Ran across this, uh, that somebody had written about uh, Jesus' identity. He says, Jesus had no servants, but they called him master. He had no degree, but they called him teacher. He had no medicines, but they called him healer. He had no armies, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, and yet today he lives. He conquered death. He is the risen one. Probably more than any other identity throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus speaks to this fact of his coming back to life after being put to death. 
In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, one of many times we read it this way. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed after three days, rise again. And he spoke plainly about this. The issue wasn't Jesus' communication about what was to come. No, it was rather his followers' comprehension. Even today, we tend to have a hard time believing that which doesn't make sense to us. In Luke 24, it opens with what we saw in our media presentation at the beginning of our service. The women going early Sunday morning and finding the stone rolled away, finding the empty tomb, finding the grave clothes empty. Jesus is gone. And they were puzzled, it says. And then two angels appear, clothed in dazzling robes. And they ask, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. Remember what he said to you while he was in Galilee. And they did. And they rushed back to tell the others. Verse 11 says, but the story sounded like nonsense to the men. And so they didn't believe it. That's exactly where many people are today. They've heard about Jesus' resurrection, but it doesn't make sense to them. And so they simply dismiss it. They choose not to believe. And that's why we need a personal encounter with Jesus. Really, the point that I want us to understand today is that when we have an encounter with Jesus, he provides for us what we need. And we'll see this in the three encounters that we find recorded for us in Luke 24. I invite you to follow along. It speaks to what happens when people encounter Jesus even today. Because you encounter Jesus, or when you encounter Jesus, uh, he will provide for you both proof and pardon. It's the first thing that we find. Put yourself in, in Peter's position for a minute, one of Jesus' followers. Uh, the disciple who, who betrayed the Lord Jesus, denied the Lord Jesus. And, and we find ourselves around that courtyard fire in the high priest's house, the place that Jesus had been taken after he was arrested. And, and you, as Peter, have denied knowing Jesus three times, just like Jesus said you would. And then Jesus is crucified, and you did nothing to defend him. And he's buried, and that was three days ago. And you've been held up in a locked room wondering what's going to happen next. It's early Sunday morning. And a group of women uh, show up at the door, all excited, babbling all at the same time. And when you finally get the story straight, you understand that the tomb is empty. And that the angels have said that Jesus has risen from the dead. He's alive. You can't believe it. It's too good to be true. You've got to see it for yourself. And so you take off running for the tomb. And indeed, you find that the tomb is open and empty. And the grave clothes are also empty, which leave three huge questions in your mind. Who did this? And where did Jesus go? And what is Jesus wearing? At that point, Peter heads home. Verse 12 says, wondering what had happened. Now, home for him was in Capernaum in Galilee, where he had been a fisherman. No, it was simply the room where he had been staying with others since that uh, Passover gathering. Mary's house, the mother of John Mark. I'm not qualified to argue with the translators, but the text literally says he went to himself. Now, he did go back to the house, but I think he was shut away with his own thoughts, wondering is the word the text uses. What if Jesus really is alive? What would Jesus think of me now? Will he disown me like I disowned him? Will it, can it ever be the same again? Have you ever felt that way after you have sinned? You've perhaps been a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ yourself, and, and then you really, really blow it. In verse 13, the story in Luke 24 shifts to the road to Emmaus, and we're left wondering what happened between verse 12 and verse 13. We know from the other gospel records that in that period of time, Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and to the other women before they left the garden tomb. 
We know at the end of this chapter, and we'll see in a few minutes, that Jesus also appeared to Peter. And in Paul's account of these events that we find in 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, For what I receive, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. We have no record of where or what was talked about in that personal encounter between Peter and the risen one. But beyond the proof to Peter that Jesus was indeed alive, I, I think we also have his pardon, his forgiving Peter of his sin. One of the evidences of a restored relationship is the lifestyle of the forgiven. They've been set free. We talked about that a few weeks ago. But not to do as they want, rather to live with gratitude for their forgiveness. And I believe we see that in Peter as he becomes a door opener for every major movement of the gospel from that point on as the church began. He was, it was proclaimed, or he was the one to proclaim it really throughout Jerusalem and Judea and into Samaria and into the Gentile world. It was his preaching on the day of Pentecost and then his going to, to Samaria to confirm what was happening there among the new believers who were hearing the gospel and coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And then he was the one that God sent to Cornelius, that Roman centurion, to share the good news with the Gentiles. And Cornelius and his entire household come to faith and are baptized. Like Peter on Resurrection Day, are you needing proof that Jesus is alive? Do you need a pardon for your sins? You'll find both in an encounter with the risen one. We move to the second encounter on that resurrection day, uh, this time with the two disciples that are headed from Jerusalem to their hometown of Emmaus. Like them, your encounter with Jesus will provide perspective. We pick the story up in Luke 24, verse 13. The two disciples are, are talking uh, about all that had happened that weekend. They had lost their joy. They had lost their leader. They had lost a friend. And with them, their sense of purpose, and they lost their hope. They say in verse 21, we had hoped that he was the Messiah who would come to rescue Israel. Jesus, whom they did not recognize, and, and that can be a problem for us too, can't it? Uh, when we get overwhelmed with life, when we are discouraged by the circumstances that are taking place around us, many of which are often beyond our control, we fail to recognize when Jesus shows up for us. Well, Jesus turned their attention back to the scriptures. Look at and listen as I read for you verses 25 to 27. We might hear Jesus saying the same thing to us today. And then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures? Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have suffered all these things before entering into his glory? And then Jesus took uh, them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining to them all the scripture, in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Uh, these disciples discovered that day what is still true for us today, that God's word comes alive for us best when we face difficult circumstances. Even when we know well what the Bible says, we don't often experience it as being alive and active and accurate and authoritative until we find ourselves in difficult times. And that is why we commend God's word to you now more than ever. Because as you read it in the midst of these difficult times, these circumstances where we find ourselves uh, sheltering in place, where we find ourselves devoid of many of the relationships that we're used to enjoying, where we find ourselves locked up with ourselves, cloistered with our families, challenged about finances, challenged about uh, responsibilities, challenged about uh, how to work with the, the technology of the day. All of these things become for us challenging experiences, and yet God makes himself real to us. We learn about God 
Even the things that we knew before have a way of becoming real for us and we gain a new perspective. These disciples put it this way, didn't our hearts burn within us when he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? Now that's the kind of heartburn that you want. When Jesus was revealed to them over dinner, he vanished, and these two jump up and they head back to Jerusalem, seven miles uphill. They wanted to share the good news. They had seen the risen Lord and when these two disciples burst into that room in Jerusalem, I, I suspect they were breathless. They, they probably had ran the last few blocks to the house. And, and uh, as they're catching their breath, everybody in the room seems to be babbling at the same time. They had good news to share too. They actually are saying the Lord really is risen and he's appeared to Peter, verse 34. And then uh, these two shall share their story how Jesus had joined them on the road, how he'd given them a new perspective from the scripture of all that had taken place and how they had recognized him as he sat down and blessed and broke the bread over dinner. Then, at that very moment, Jesus showed up, suddenly standing among them, it says in verse 36, peace be with you, he said. And here we find one more provision, one more benefit of an encounter with Jesus because your encounter with Jesus can provide peace. For Christ followers, the presence of Jesus will always provide peace. It dissolves our disbelief. It dissolves our doubt. Jesus provided for them the tangible evidence of the sensory perception, the sight, the sound, the touch, the taste. Look at verse 39. It says, look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. In verse 41, and then he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And he gave them, they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched. Verse 41, we back up to that and it says, they stood there filled with joy and wonder. When we encounter Jesus, it will move us to just as it did through uh, the account of Luke 24 from Peter's wondering, questioning, trying to figure out what had happened to, to this being filled with joy and wonder. From wonder to wonder. We don't have to uh, a face-to-face -face encounters with the Lord Jesus today as these disciples did. But we can't have heart-to-heart -heart encounters. We can't have a faith-to-face -face encounter, if you will, with the Lord Jesus. To Thomas, who would refuse to believe that Jesus was alive until he saw him for himself, Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. That would be all of us today as Christ followers, isn't it? Does it include you? Do you believe? As he did for Peter and later for Thomas, Jesus proved, can will prove to you that he's alive. And as he did for Peter, he will offer you pardon, the forgiveness for your sins, your fears, your failures. He offers reconciliation, the restoration of a relationship. Are you ready to admit your need for that? Are you ready to receive that? And as he did for the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, he offers perspective, replacing your sadness, replacing your despair, replacing your hopelessness and helplessness. He offers uh, that all of that in the word of, that the word of God says about him and about his father, the one true God, the one who knows all, the one who is everywhere at the same time, the one who has all power. And a relationship with him places you into his family in which he promises to care for you. So there's nothing in the world, nothing in your life beyond his awareness, beyond his control, beyond the good design that he has for you. 
And again, a lot of people reject that because it doesn't seem to them as they're going through life that that could be true. They don't see how that could be. But, but that's where we're called to live by faith to live not by sight, to trust God with all of our heart and with all of our mind, with all of our strength, to not lean on our own understanding, but to acknowledge Him in all of our ways, allowing Him to direct our paths. That has been God's consistent message throughout His Word and throughout history. History is really, you know, his story. It's how he's revealed himself to us through all of the world's history so that we might know him, so that we might trust him with our lives. And finally, he offers us peace. We experience that peace when we enter into relationship with him. And we find that that peace is, is going to be the result of his presence with us and the fulfillment of his promise. In verse 44, he says, When I was with you, I told you. He had promised all of this to his followers, even as he's promised it to us. And it comes with the accompanying power of his authority. Are you ready for that kind of encounter with Jesus? Are you ready for that encounter with the risen one? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus make possible for us a personal relationship with Jesus. But we must admit that we're sinners, that we need a Savior, that we cannot save ourselves. We must believe that what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary so many years ago, he did for you and for me to pay the penalty that we deserve the debt that we owe for our sin. He took it on himself. It's what we remembered on Friday, Good Friday. And then we must commit our lives to him, inviting him into our lives to be the forgiver of our sins, the leader of our lives. And you can do that right where you are, right in your home, right wherever you're watching, on whatever you're watching. Because the issue is the attitude of your heart, your surrender before God, your, your humility and confession before Him, and to say to Him, I need an encounter with you, the risen one. I need you to forgive my sins. And so I receive that forgiveness and I, I commit my life to you. Become the forgiver of my sins. Come, Become the leader of my life. However you choose to express that in your own words. But it's a matter of confession and acceptance, believing, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for your eternal life. And Jesus says then that we pass from death to life. We pass from darkness to light. That we become born again that we have the right on that confession, on that acceptance, to become children of God. And if that becomes true of you today, if that is a prayer that you pray today, or if we can help you understand better so that you can make that decision, then would you let us know? You can let us know by uh, checking in on the Facebook comments or, or email us at holbert at newlifechicago.org. We want to hear from you. I promised you a book earlier on, and if you'd like that, uh, send, a, send us an email request at holbert at newlifechicago.org, and we'll get that to you. We're going to need a mailing address. Uh, give us a contact number, a phone number, or email, or uh, something so that we can confirm that with you, make sure we get the address right. And for as many as, uh, as long as we have them, as long as the supply lasts, we'll be happy to share that with you. I trust that for you this day, It'll be a wonderful resurrection day as you celebrate our risen Lord. Enjoy a relationship with him. Let me pray. Father God, you know uh, every person that's listening today, those that are part of our church family, those that are guests among us, and we ask your blessing upon each one of them. Encourage their hearts. Father, for those that don't yet know you as personal Savior, who have not yet accepted or received, unwrapped the gift of eternal life that you have available for them because of the purchase that the Lord Jesus Christ made on the cross of Calvary. 
Would you draw them to yourself? Would you give them understanding? Would you uh, help them to understand that you indeed are alive? Would you become their proof today of that? Would you assure them of pardon? Would you change their perspective? Would you fill them with peace? This would be our heart's desire on this Easter for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I hope that you enjoyed your time of worship as, with us this morning. So just a few announcements for you. First thing, Miller's Mary Manor Nursing Home is welcoming and encouraging the children in our congregation to draw and color pictures to send to the staff and residents there. They are also welcoming adults to send cards and letters of encouragement and support. And so also with visitors continually being restricted during these times, the staff and residents are engaging in long games of bingo on a daily basis. And so these bingo games usually have prizes to them that the staff are running really low on or out of. And so they're asking that you buy any of the following items to help the bingo games going, whether they be toiletries, snacks, a soda, 
uh, drinks, chips, and juice, and etc. Anything would be welcomed. And so if you are interested um, in helping Miller's Mary Manor with that regard, their address is 29 01 West 37th Avenue in Hobart, Indiana, and they'd be more than glad um, to take those donations. Um, another place that we are asking in terms of help for is the Hobart Food Pantry. Um, the Hobart Food Pantry is requesting food donations during a time where many families are in need. Just a few weeks ago, they were serving 165 families alone, and that number has since increased. And so um, they have, they, a few weeks ago, they had food for only about three weeks, but they definitely need more to accommodate families in the, in our community and beyond. And so they are in greatest need for peanut butter, tuna, uh, spaghetti sauce, and pasta. However, they will take anything that you are willing to donate and all donations will definitely be used. And so if you're interested in helping us out uh, in that need, um, the address to the Hobart Food Pantry in which you could drop food off is 200 South Hobart Road in Hobart, Indiana. And also, last but not least, um, the American Red Cross is looking for individuals who are willing to donate blood during a time where many people in medical facilities are an ongoing critical need to do COVID-19. And so please consider donating blood as some people's lives are depending on it. And so the nearest blood drive that's coming up is actually this upcoming Monday um, at at uh, the Merrillville Blood Donation Center, and the address for that is 791 East 83rd Avenue in Merrillville, Indiana. And that'll be happening from noon all the way up to 5 p.m. So if you are considering donating blood, please go ahead and go to that center. And also, if you have any needs, feel free to contact us. Uh, we will try our best to accommodate and meet any of the needs that you have to the best of our ability because we want you to know that we love you and we care for you. And so with all that being said, if you would please go ahead and take the time to pray with me as we celebrate the rest of the day about the Lord's resurrection. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, you are so good to us. And Lord, we celebrate that you rose from the dead today. And because of that, Father God, we know that you are on the throne. And we know that we are yours and that we have victory over sin and death for those of us who have given our lives to you. And Lord, this day, if there's someone that has given their life over to you, coming to know you as Lord and Savior, Father God, I pray that you would um, all the more give them an assurance of that. And Lord, we as New Life Holbert would embrace them into our family. And so Father God, may throughout the rest of this day, may we live with the joy and the hope knowing that you are alive, Father God. And so we thank you for this wonderful, wonderful day. Guide us uh, in everything of what we say, think, and do, having our heart's affection and mind's attention on you. So I hope that you had a wonderful time with us today, and may you enjoy the rest of your day. God bless. God sent his son, they called him Jesus, he came to love, he ran for you, he lived in God, to buy my pardon. Because he lives, I confess to 
fear is gone.